Peace forever and always, and welcome to another edition of what we call the Realities Temple on Earth Internet Ministry. I'm the host and the gatekeeper of this program, Angel Snub Nub Seven. <clears throat> shout out to our uh, chat room, shout out to the Deacons of Reality, shout out to Armand Delight, shout out to Mellow Cap, shout out to all those who support this platform. Shout out to our overseas listeners. Shout out to those who are listening in the clouds. Shout out to friends and family and enemies. <laughs> Every little bit counts. <laughs> I only have 10 subscribers. I only get 10 views. So every little bit counts. <laughs> we are simulcasting on our sister channel, Angel Snub No. 7. And we also on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Some of you who f who are consistent followers, not followers or listeners of this ministry, you know that I had uh, spoken on this topic before on our sister channel, Angel Snubbed Up Seven. I got to speak real truth regardless of consequence. The reason why I'm revisiting this topic is because we had technical difficulties and the whole commentary did not download to the channel like it's supposed to, only, only 11 minutes. So I decided to revisit that topic and hopefully, things will uh, go as they should go so that we can copy the video and share it to our various social media platforms. For, for a person like myself, I always stay in trouble. I'm always pissing somebody off even though I've done nothing to them. And one of the things that piss people off is my righteous behavior. You would think that's good. <laughs> you would think that's good if you exhibit something that they call righteous behavior, you would think that's good. Contrary to popular belief, people will become jealous of you for almost anything. You're too dark, you're too light, you're too poor, you're too rich. You walk too tall. Jealous of your shoes, jealous how you talk. Among human beings, you're not going to be able to avoid this. And the sad thing, even jealousy and envy can come up among your own family members. Even your mother and father who brought you into this world can be jealous and envious of you. So there's not too much, there's not too much escape when you're dealing with human beings and out of all the things that you should not be jealous, you should <laughs> clap your hands, you should Stomp your feet when somebody can say, I walk upright. I'm a righteous person. You should be happy in this environment of filth that we live in. Murder and rape and pedophilia. 
lies and slander and gossip. But a person can say honestly and there's no debate because it's obvious and nobody can debunk, nobody can refute what is right where our eyes, we, it's not invisible. And there's testimony that this person walks this way. You should be happy. But I have been shown jealousy and envy because of how I came up trying to live a righteous life from the very beginning. Let me explain. Can I can I explain? <laughs> can I explain just a little bit? Just the fact that I said this. What you mean? You you righteous? You don't even believe in God. You don't have to believe in God to be a righteous person. Simply treat a person as you want to be treated. Simply do those things which is in the best interest of your life. You live in a righteous lifestyle. We did not say perfect. Righteous, righteousness does not mean that you're perfection because there's no way in the hell any of us can be perfect. There's no perfect person. Do they claim that even Jesus Christ, do they claim that Jesus was perfect? Because if they do, it would be a lie because the scriptures don't show the Jesus Christ of the Bible being a perfect person. So that would be false. It's difficult trying to be a righteous person in a world contrary to righteous behavior. It's difficult. Especially when you are a child. Alone. So it's up to you to determine what you should and should not do. So many children fall to the wayside. Driven to the streets. End up in prostitution and pornography and drug addiction and alcoholism. They just gravitate towards those things because it's difficult to stand up and be right in an unrighteous environment. It's difficult. I get in trouble because I want to be right. Well, brother, I thought you was going to explain it. You talking all that. Why don't you just Skip all the la da da da. Get to the point, man. What do you mean? <laughs> We're very impatient people. <laughs> We're very impatient because I want to hear you justify how you write. Because they know they're not right themselves. So how the hell you going to be right? I grew up, and some of you need to do the math, maybe. I was raised toward the end, but I was born in, but I was, I was raised toward the end of what we know of as Jim Crow. Contrary to popular belief, just because the Civil Rights Bill was signed in 1965, I believe, 64, 65. And all this civil rights legislation was gained. As soon as they write 
on the paper does not mean that's the end of Jim Crow. The reality was what we know of as Jim Crow continued into the 1970s. I know because I lived it. You can't tell me I lived it. I was in school as a child and you know how in many schools we have fire drills, tornado drills in school. Well, my school, we had to have a different kind of drill, a riot drill. Because the young teenage white children and the teenage black children was always fighting each other. We was on one side of the tracks. They were on another side of the tracks. I don't know how they got together. But anyway, we end up fighting in the school. And when the fighting broke out, they would, the younger children like myself, they would call like a, a tornado drill, fire drill. They would treat it like a fire or tornado drill when, the, when those teenagers got to fighting out there in front of the school. So this goes to show you that some type of racial unrest, even in a small town where I was brought up, it was still going on. This was the 1970s. My family was originally from the state of Mississippi. And then, like many, migrated to the north, migrated to the east, migrated to the west, Midwest, West Coast. So my mother, in 1972, I believe, when we moved to the St. Louis, Missouri area. But prior to that, so that would make me around nine years old. So when I was experiencing at, at a young age what I was doing, I had to be at least seven and a half or eight, possibly going on nine years, very young person. But I realized as a young person that this thing called Jim Crow this discrimination against the people that I come from, something ain't right. And it wasn't Dr. King's words. It wasn't the words of my grandfather. It wasn't the words of a preacher, the one who opened my eyes to the injustice and what Jim Crow really was. The first one that taught me about this was my white teacher at school and she told me that your people were slaves in this nation at one time I'm like what that was a heartbreaker because I didn't know what a slave was <laughs> what, do, what do you mean we my people we were sl slaves in this country at one time until recently, I did not know that I actually was born on a slave plantation. A real slave plantation. I did not know that was a slave plantation. With his own zip code at the time. That made me feel some kind of way as a child. It made me very angry as a child. And then when I was introduced to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they went into, he went into more detail how long this was going on 
and the evils of the South. And I was born in the most wicked state in the South, Mississippi. Movies even made about Mississippi, Mississippi burning. I'm like, wow. Now, prior to this, my family, they never made us go to church, but they were Christians. And I don't remember them going to church every Sunday, but they would go to church. I never was forced, like some of you was, I never was forced to go to church. I went to church because mama went. I went to church because grandma and grandpa, they went to church. And, I, and if you a country boy, that was the only, you wanted to get, a, the only time you really had a chance to get out of the house was go to school or go to church. <laughs> so just to get, just to get out of the house, I want to go to church. But as a child, I believe what the preacher said. I believe what I was taught about God and the devil, heaven and hell. I believe that. So as a little baby, because that's what I was, I was a little baby. I'm going to do what I can to go to heaven. So I I was the best, now I'm a, a baby, I'm a child, but I'm going to be the best child I can be because I want to go to heaven. I want to see Jesus. I want Jesus to come for me. I believe that. So when I walked around in my faith, it was real, unlike some of y'all. I'm not putting on no show. Like some of y'all do. You come out here and you put on this front like you one thing, see you in real life, you something else. I've always been real with mine as a child. And I don't know why I was at the pond looking at the fish looking at the frogs and the ducks and I don't know why I'm a child and I said to myself I don't want any children which which was the best decision I ever made I that's the best decision I ever made that made life much much easier and I helped somebody avoid Pain and suffering. The hell that I've been through for 60 years. Is this to say that all your 60 years was pain and suffering? No. But this is an unnatural lifestyle. And some of us, we become comfortable. In the pain. Like black people in this country. You tell them about pain and suffering. What? What you mean by that? Because they're used to it. Because your great great grandfather. Suffered. They made it. Or your ancestors. They made it. So you don't care. And you leave more pain and suffering for your children. Huh, they'll make it. But you know this is hell's kitchen. So as a child living in hell's kitchen, I said to myself, I'm not going to put a child through that. That's child abuse. And I know a lot of you with children don't want to hear that. I love my, I love my kids. I sure do. I love my... You love your kids knowing there's a probability 
They could be like Breonna Taylor or George Floyd or Sean Bell or Matt Turner being lynched and skinned. And you're going to bring them here anyway. And then when it happened, did I, you, you look like Steve Urkel. Did I do that? <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you did that. Yeah, you did that. And there's nothing wrong with wanting children. There's nothing wrong with loving your children. That, that's a responsibility. And the only responsibility you want to do, put clothes on their back, give them an education, feed them, put some shelter. That's all on your mind. You're not, you're not looking at the whole picture that they are in a racist nation and you are part of a people that have been catching hell in hell's kitchen almost 500 years. And you want to bring them to hell. So when you tell somebody, one of us, go to hell, they don't have to go nowhere. We've already been here, been here for years. We've never had a taste of heaven. You just learn how to live comfortable on the slave plantation. You control nothing. You control no resources. You, you control, you make no laws. You just hear. Always under the boot of somebody else. Then you want to call yourself a man. How you going to call yourself a man and you don't control nothing? Even somebody like Jay-Z. Even somebody like Will Smith or Barack Obama. They don't control nothing. Always a manager. But you never own the business. You're always a supervisor. You might even be the CEO. But you don't control and run nothing. Because they can fire you. Anytime they feel like it. Because this is my stuff. You don't run and control nothing. I understood these things at seven or eight years old. You're a grown man. You're a grown woman. And you don't understand it to this day. Because you're comfortable in this. I was a child and was not comfortable. And the adults around me, I'm looking at them. How can you be comfortable in this? Why you bring me into this? But the purpose of religion is to help you and give you the faith and give you hope that things will be better. So I had, so as a Christian, I had my faith and hope to do better. But, but for me personally, as a child, who didn't even know, I didn't even know where babies come from. I don't even know where babies come from. I'm not going to have any children. And then I learned about Jim Crow. I learned about slavery. So I had to be very young. When I stood up, when I was a child, it was mandatory that we pledge allegiance to the flag every morning. Before class start, you put your hand on your, your heart, raise your hand. I don't know which one it was because I, I refuse to do it. What is the right? One hand over your heart and lift it. I don't know how you do it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for where it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for everybody. That's what we had to do. But when I learned about the evils of this nation against my people as a baby, I said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. Now, prior to this, I loved Jesus. 
Well, I still love Jesus. But prior to this, I, I love this nation. I used to draw the American flag all the time. And I still think that the American flag is a pretty flag. But now I truly understand what it represents. And that's not pretty. Especially for my people that I'm coming from. And so we are at this school assembly. And I'm eight and a half, nine. And we're supposed to stand up. I refuse to. My first protest. The original Michael Evans from Good Time. Boy is a white racist word. Before good time. And the principal came to me. You are embarrassing us. Stand up. And pledge allegiance. I'm not going to do it. They called my mother. Now mind you. Other children. Knew what I knew. And they would not say anything. Mind you adults. Wouldn't stand with me. And this was a black school. Remember things were segregated. So I went to. Basically. Almost. Well actually it was all black school. We had Caucasian teachers. Some of the teachers were Caucasian. It was a segregated school. Stop listening to this lie that black people wanted to integrate. That's a damn lie. Black people were trying to get equal education. That's why they was doing what they're doing. Nobody was running around. I want to. I want to marry me a white woman. I want to marry me a white man and go to the white man's school. That ain't what was happening. Stop telling that damn lie. That's not what it was all about. That was put on the table. And I guess they said better than nothing. And so they went for it. But ain't nobody was running around. I want to. I want to. I don't. I want to stop going to black owned businesses. They ain't what happened. You were tricked again. And they did what they did. They didn't know who they was dealing with. They didn't know. Certain behaviors that they would exhibit. They did not know that was detrimental to them. They thought they was trying to just make. They thought they was making things better for themselves. It was cheaper. To let these. That's cheaper. Than actually Jim Crow. Separate but equal. And then this gives them the illusion of inclusion. And you lost when you gamble with that. You lost. We lost. It's quite obvious we lost. But that was not the intent. So I wish these black power idiots stop. They're not going to stop. They, they want to keep selling that narrative. I know exactly what happened because I lived it. And many of these black power idiots lived it. But want to keep telling that damn lie. Because they are a failure. The reason why we're able to do whatever little thing that we do is because of the civil rights movement, Dr. King. We gain nothing. We gain nothing from the black power movement. Nothing. If so, put it in the chat room. Now, the only one out of all that stuff, black power garbage, that we continue to use to this day might be some of the things that were started by the Black Panther Party. The lunch program. Well, 
But all this blackity black stuff, it gained us nothing except some tough talk. And that's all they're doing right now to this day. And begging you for money to produce absolutely nothing. No GED class, no basketball goals, no free clinics, no free mental health facilities, because Lord knows a lot of us done gone nuts for real. You don't get nothing from black power. Except a bunch of talk. So I'm a so I'm telling my story because I was active, I was active in the church, and I was active in the streets. Because I was upset about our condition as a child. What was you doing? Seven, eight, nine years old. Y'all was playing with G.I. Joe, Barbie. That's what you was doing. You didn't, you didn't have no concern about the condition of people. Because, and see, I was surrounded by people who didn't give a damn about the condition. So I'm thinking to myself, why I can't be like them? Why I can't just ignore the condition? Why I can't be like them? Enjoy my childhood. Why should I mess up my childhood thinking about these things that really should be it's, a, it's adult issues? And so when I tell my story like that, because some of you did not become interested in the blackity black struggle till you had some age on you. You didn't care. You didn't care when you were seven, eight, nine years old. Because I know none of my grand relatives, they don't give a damn about the struggle. Period. It's not an issue for them. I was a child. But I wasn't the only one because if you look, go back, you will see children involved in the civil rights struggle that, that left their school to be bit by dogs, sprayed with fire hoses. Where was their parents at? Where was all these adults at? The children had to stand up because the mothers and the fathers was cowards. They comfortable in this. So I used to tell my story even to some of the people that were in the nation of Islam. Because these most folks always have their these stories. I was a sinner before I met Elijah Mohammed. I used to smoke, I used to drink, I used to be a whoremonger. I, I was a gang member. I was a murderer. Like the story of Malcolm X. He was a criminal. He did this and messed with the white women and he dealt drugs or, or whatever. But then I met Elijah Muhammad. And he straightened me up. Then I met Jesus. I met Jesus. And the light just came on. <laughs> but see, but when I talk, I never smoked. I never drank. I never was a. I wasn't a criminal. I wasn't a whoremonger. Matter of fact, I told you. 
I didn't want any children. I already knew about the struggle. I didn't have to be taught nothing special. So when I tell my story, folks like, you think you better than somebody? I did not say I was better. You said that. I didn't. I told you my story. Because I never drank. I never smoked. I never done drugs. I always strive to live a righteous life for me, not because to please God. That never, that never was the case. I didn't want to go to hell, but I wanted to do things for me. Not because I was doing this to try to avoid hell. I'm doing this because it was good for me. And folks get jealous because you never, because you were strong enough and you never went through those things. I'm happy for you that you was able to come up out of that bad condition and do better. But the teachings of Jesus Christ, the teachings of the Quran, all these things, they didn't help me. This is what I was all the time. I didn't need that to give me no hope, give me faith in anything. I didn't need those things. And folks jealous of you. Because you didn't have to. You didn't cut. So, so the jealousy. Where did the jealousy come from? The jealousy comes from. It's obvious then. It's clear. Then I must have a leg up. And the reality is. I do have a leg up. Because these things. Never made me righteous. I always was that. I didn't need a Bible to make me righteous. Righteousness is not perfection. You make mistakes in life. But you strive to do what is in the best interest of yourself in your life. And you want to treat a person as you want to be treated. And I guess that's the reason why I was attracted to the struggle because as I continued to live, I began to see that these people who oppressed my people were bullies. And being a victim of being bullied, I truly understand what is really going on here. I hate bullies. And I like to see bullies fall. Bullies are cowards. They only bully you because they believe you can't hurt them. And this is what y'all don't understand. The only reason why these people do what they do to us is because they don't have to suffer no kind of consequence. Now it may seem but the thing about Israel they live a stressful life because they know the Palestinians willing to fight back. Even if it's just throwing rocks and bricks, they willing to fight back. You're going to pay some kind of price messing with them. And clearly you can't wipe them out because they've been doing this for a long, long time. The current president, what's his name? Nate U2 or whatever. I don't know what his damn name is and don't care. When you listen to him talk, we got to get rid of them once and for all. That sounds good. But what kind of price are you going to pay? 
Everything that we do, there's a price to pay. Are you really willing to do, sir, what it takes to get rid of them once and for all? And if you did get rid of them once and for all, do that mean that you're going to live a peaceful life, sir? They live a life of stress. That's a hell of a life. You can't go nowhere. You got to live a life of paranoia. Shout out to Bushwick Bill. May he rest in peace. Shout out to the Ghetto Boys. The Ghetto Boys had a song. My mind playing tricks on me. Why is your mind playing tricks on you? Because you done done dirt to somebody. And you always got to look over your shoulder. Under the table. Always looking around. That's a stressful life. Because you never know. When retaliation going to come. My mind playing tricks on me. That's a hell of a lifestyle. The same thing in America. This racist nation. They keep an eye. They keep an eye on what I say. They keep an eye on what other black people are saying. They keep an eye on you. Because... They are afraid. One day the retaliation. Because you know you have done wrong. So you got to always watch your back. What they doing, what they saying. J. Edgar Hoover talk about the Rise of a black messiah. To do what? Retaliation. Because you know what you done done to somebody. Retaliation. That's a stressful life. So you got to have your CIA. Your FBI. You got to have all your in intelligence agencies. This, the attack on Israel by Hamas took them by surprise. And they always talk about the intelligence. Another word for our snitches. Because we're always going to have snitches among us somewhere around willing to sell you out for a few dollars. Our Judas. So they were shocked because I guess people didn't give a damn about their money. And Hamas was able to pull this off. Dude, what happened? How did it happen? Uh, our intelligence, intelligence is another word, our snitches didn't come forth and tell us about this. That's what they mean by our intelligence, our informants. So really you should applaud the people of Hamas for that, the Palestinian people, because nobody snitched. Folks get tired of being bullied. Folks get tired of oppression. Except black Americans. <laughs> All that we do is go to the funeral and cry. Oh, George Floyd. Oh, oh. George Show was a good, good man. He always was good. He bought me a soda pop when I was three years old. Good old George Floyd. 
That's all we know how to do. Go to funerals. The only thing the Palestinian people need is creative and better leadership. That's all they need. The rise of a Palestinian Messiah. They keep doing the same stuff over. It's not, that's not working. But if the, the right leader come up, it's on and popping. Their leadership is like these black power people, except they will take action. These black power people won't do nothing except run their mouth. You will never see none of these black, these black, black power stuff. They will never do nothing like what Hamas done. Never. Only in self-defense. They came after us. We was, we was fighting in self-defense. That's the only time you'll see all this blacky black power kill the cracker. Like that one brother, kill the cracker. It's so embarrassed. Don't, they don't even talk about that brother no more. What's his name? I forgot what his name was. He always talked, kill the cracker babies. So the cracker, the adult cracker, pulled him and his boys over. Here's your opportunity, sir, because they had they got the they had the guns. Here's your opportunity, kill the cracker. This is an adult. You kill the adult, then you can go kill his baby. But when the adult came, showed up, didn't fire one bullet, laid their happy ass on the ground, and went to jail. And then went on probation. Never to be heard from again. After talking all that crap. Telling the other people. Kill the cracker. Kill the cracker babies. So there's jealousy. There was jealousy. Amongst many folks. When I tell my story. Because. I don't need, I didn't need the Bible. I didn't need the teachings of Elijah Muhammad or the Bible to be a righteous person. I never done that. I always was striving to be upright. Folks get jealous. You think you better than somebody. I never said that. You think that I'm better. But apparently, I do have a leg up because you had to go through all that drama. I didn't have to go through all that. You fighting to be where I always been when I was a little boy. So yes, I do have a leg. I didn't have to go through all that. I was smart and wise enough to avoid all that. Then you have all your house full of all these children in your house that you really don't know what to do with. Because I don't care what you teach these children. You can teach them black power, whatever. Since the day they was born, there's no guarantee they're going to follow your lead. I know two young boys serving life sentences. I was there I was around, I wasn't there, I was around when they were born in the nation of Islam. And they put on their little FOI uniforms and the bow tie. And they're in prison right now. So who gonna save them? Because Malcolm learned about Elijah Muhammad in prison, and a lot of y'all, y'all learned Jesus and, and Yahweh, all this stuff in prison. What if you already know that already? So I guess you have to adopt Jesus, you know, one of the ones that you haven't adopted yet. Because clearly, whatever you already had didn't work. Now you're in prison. Jealousy. 
jealousy and envy. There's jealousy and envy towards me because this platform is from me. It's not from the Bible or the Quran and the teachings and all this John Henry Clark history book. This is me. If we all come from God, if we all products of the universe, why I cannot exhibit wisdom as other people have? Because I'm unorthodox. Actually, I'm natural. You're the one that's unnatural because you talk about belief. And you need fairy tales and spiritual lies in order to function. And we accept reality as it is. We don't need that. We concentrate and respect and we learn from others but we know how to do it to ourselves. We understand this is a new day. This is a new time with a new people that need a new way of doing things because the old way did not work. Why do you believe that they want to transition from the gas engine to the electric car? Because the gas is detrimental the electric is supposed to be a better way. You still gonna have a car, but we need to let go of these fossil fuels because they pollute the air, the environment, and so forth. The electric car is supposed to be more environmentally friendly. Less noise, of course. It's a lot of benefits to the electric car. So the government is spending billions of dollars to try to transfer the car from gas to electric. But you're still going to be driving a car. You don't understand the transition because we're still black power. But this is a different period of time. We're still that. Nothing has changed. Still speaking for us. It's a different period. It's a different time. Jealousy and envy. And we don't understand the time. And you don't even have no faith in yourself. We want to continue to try to follow dead people. And you are lying. I don't, I've never understood the concept. Trying to follow dead people. And you ask the dead person a question they can't answer. All these factions of the Moorish Science Temple. This is what I think the prophet said or done or would do. Because he's dead, he can't tell you nothing. All these factions of Elijah Muhammad. Because he's not here no more. Can't tell you anything. And these folks steady. Trying to, trying to follow dead people. I'm trying to follow Jesus. Jesus ain't told you nothing. What you think. Well, if you got to think, why don't you think, why don't you make it where it could actually come from you? Because you making all this other stuff up because Jesus, Malcolm, Harriet Tubman, none of these people.
people, none of our people who are gone ain't telling you a damn thing. It's all your thoughts. So why don't you just make it your thoughts? Instead of trying to copy somebody that's not here no more. Because they serve their time. And it did not work. There was some success, but that did not work. But now we can take a little bit from the nation of Islam, a little bit from Noah Jali, the Moor Science Temple. We can take a little bit from the Yahweh organization. We can take a, a little bit from the church. We can bring them to, together and combine them, all their good assets to make one. So that you can one, you can win. Once and for all, instead of this going round and round in circle garbage that we've been doing for the last 50 years. I was excited when I was first introduced to the teachings of Elijah Muhammad because the teachings helped me deal with Self-hatred, which still continues to this day. That's why I probably can't tell you nothing because I'm too black for you. And black represents nigga. And a nigga can't tell you nothing. I'm not smart enough. But you turn around and talk about how God, well, well how you, why you, why God can't talk to me? Because I don't sound. I'm not operating the way you think I'm supposed to operate. But that's stupid. Because that's your brother or sister. Y'all all came from the same mother. But you all act different. Same mother, same father. But you all act different. So just because I act different. You mean to tell me, so that means God has nothing to do with me. Now, you believe in God. And you say, I'm a child of God. And you say that God made me. And nothing exists without God's permission. So here I am. I'm from God just like you are. And I serve a purpose just like you do. And maybe I have the answer because you have failed God. So, since you failed God, the believers, whether you're a Christian, whether you're Muslim or Yahweh or Israel, whatever you want to call yourself, since you have failed me, maybe I will give, I will give the knowledge to the one that really understands. So they can be successful. Because I've given it to them. I've given it to those. Who believe in me. And they can't get nothing going. But you bring to me hatred. You bring to me jealousy. And envy. But you had your opportunity. You had your chance. You can't tell me. What I say is not right. You've never proven it. It never been tried. What you talking about have been tried. It does not work. That's not my problem. That's why I exist. If it worked, I, there's no need. I'd be happy to sit down and shut up. And like I have done in the past. Help you. Do what needs to be done. That's no problem for me. It's a problem for you. It's no not problem for me. So when I had these teachings of Elijah Muhammad, I got fired up. I got fired up with the teachings of Elijah Muhammad just like any of you would get fired up over anything. Some of you, you might... Discover a new way of frying chicken. Man, that chicken good as a god. Man, this chicken good. And you want to 
share that. Go to a restaurant and the food is, is, is you get on the phone, man. I just, man, these ribs at this place, bruh, let me tell you, you need to go check this out. That's how we do. That's how we do when you like something. Man, you need to, wow. You need to get this pair of shoes. You, need, you get excited over stuff. And you want to share that so others can share in the good that you have discovered. So I was fired up when I heard the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. But I must confess, it wasn't the religious part of the teaching. It was the brother and the sisterhood. Not really the teachings. I really, I knew the teachings, but I really, I, that, that, I always had a problem, even when I was a Christian, some of those teachings like the mother plane, if you notice, you won't find videos where Malcolm X is talking about the mother plane, a lot of that spooky type stuff. And I don't even think when you listen to Malcolm talk, I don't even think he talked about Master Farah Muhammad being God. To my knowledge, I don't remember when Malcolm spoke, I never heard him really talk about Master Farah Muhammad being God in person. He was attracted to the militancy of the nation of Islam. That it was dare stand up against an oppressor. That's what Malcolm was. And that's what a lot of brothers and sisters, they don't really get into Yaku. I don't think Malcolm talk, talked about Yaku. Now, Minister Farrakhan is different. Because Minister Farrakhan is spooky. Really a spooky. He never was militant. He was an entertainer. And that's, that's very entertaining. So he's going to talk about Yaku, and he's going to talk about Allah in person. That Farrakhan would do that. But see, Malcolm was a militant. Malcolm was really against the oppressor. I don't, I'll deal with that later. That don't mean nothing as long as I got this sucker on my back. That's what I was attracted to. But, you know, when you do something like that, you have to accept it as it is. So we, we accept it. All of it. I used to write letters to my relatives. I wrote a letter to one of my sisters. It was 10 pages long. Actually, it was 20 pages long. Because I would write on the front and the back of the paper. It was 20 pages long. I would go out with my final call newspapers at all times in the night, talking to people on the streets. I was excited. Y'all need to hear the life-giving teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as spoken by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, which I never called him Honorable Minister Farrakhan. I always just called him Brother Farrakhan. And at that time, he just went by the national representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He never used the Honorable anything. But I was excited because I thought it, this was the truth. And it worked for me even as a child. I was able to have conversation at eight, nine years old, ten years old, or whatever, with adults because of the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. That made me feel like something. And in school, because I studied the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, but I also read books and things outside of those teachings. I was always reading, trying to learn different things. I was able to have conversation at nine, eight, nine, ten years old with adults. That was exciting. Wherever I went with the teachings, I could talk to anybody. No matter how ed educated or uneducated, I could talk to anybody. And in the 80s, People wanted to see the nation of Islam come back. Man, I'm glad to see y'all brothers back out here, man. Glad to see you. Glad to see those bow ties back out there. I was very proud of that. The people was ready. But the man leading the 
charge, immature. The man leading the charge, no vision. The man leading the charge, the nation of Islam is nothing but a, a church. And that's all they have today. The Million Man March was nothing but a large church revival. There was nothing revolutionary or militant about it. That's why they don't mind that you march every year or whatever. Go out there, cry, clap your hands, stump your feet. And those Caucasian political leaders sit back, watch it on TV. Stupid Negroes. Uh, they be need to shut up. Be glad when they finish singing and shut up. So we can go back to our football games, our baseball game. And you do. You clap your hands, stomp your feet. I love the Oliver Miss the Lynch fan can. Or we go back into the past. Dr. King, shh, he show spokes really, really good at the March on Washington. We go back in the past, whatever. Yeah, whatever. And fo white folks sit back in the cut. Negroes ain't learned a damn thing. You have more money, you have more education, but you ain't learned a damn thing. That's why they know if they kill your leadership, you're done. They know if they kill that black messiah, you're done. Because you have yet to learn how to think for yourself. Go for yourself. So the Bible calls us sheep. And the Bible calls us children. And we never grow up. So to make a long story short. 2003. 2004. I don't know exactly what year, somewhere around there. Somebody gave me a tape of Pastor Ray Hagans, who is the preacher of the from the African village. They gave me the tape because they know how I was. You know, blackity black, all that type of stuff. They knew that. You might like Pastor Hagen. He sound like that Nation of Islam stuff. I said, oh yeah, I, I listen to... See, that's the difference between you and me. I, I can listen to anybody. These people hate us. Hate me so bad. They won't even try to listen. Soon as I start to, start to talk, you ain't talking. That nigga ain't talking about nothing. And throw, throw. I don't do that. I listen to your video. I listen to your tapes. I listen to your DVDs. That's why I can talk about your DVDs and your tapes. And your books, because I've read your books. I've listened to your DVDs. You are not in a position to judge Angel Snuff Number 7, because you ain't listened to nothing. Because you're scared. I didn't know you were wrong before you even start to play my video. But you want to hold on to what's wrong. And you wonder why you can't get right. I listen to Pastor Hagen. And I agree with much of what he had to say. But what stuck in my mind. Is when Pastor Hagen said Jesus never historically existed. 
I'm like, when I heard that, because as far as I knew, these people actually existed. He said, and he explained and shown why Jesus did not exist. That messed me up. I'm like, what? Jesus never existed. And when you begin to think about it, it's true. So, I had to, from that day, I decided to start all over from scratch, re-examine what I was taught from the Baptist Church, Nation of Islam, from all that black power stuff that I had been reading throughout the years. I decided, and actually, since I was locked up, <laughs> I had all the time in the world. I had to re-examine everything that I was taught. And I began to, to start thinking for myself. And I began to see. I said, wait a minute. That don't make sense. That don't make no sense. That don't make sense. That sounds like an outright lie. I mean, I always was a thinker. Like in the nation of Islam, they teach do not eat peanuts because nuts take five years of your life. But a peanut is not a nut. A peanut is a legume. It's in the bean family. It's an underground bean. It's not a nut. Nuts come from trees. It's, it's right and exact. But that's not right and exact. Peanuts are not nuts. Legumes. It's a bean. But you let it go. You just ignore. You ignore what you know. For the religion. I had to start all over from scratch. And then I began to realize. I couldn't continue down that road. I don't know what kind of road I need to go. But that road, I can't do it no more because it's lies. It's fabrications. It's a lot of falsification. Fairy tales and mythology. It's not real. Because Jesus never existed. So if Jesus never existed, that mean the Holy Quran is a bunch of bull. That mean the Bible is a bunch of bull. That mean Judaism is a bunch of bull. These Abrahamic religions is a bunch of bull because they all interface with each other and Jesus is a leading character and Jesus didn't exist. Then it goes on. You will see Moses never existed. Abraham never existed. The majority of these folks in the Bible and Quran did not exist. And a lot of the things in the Bible and Quran, when you think about it, don't make sense. So I had to let it go. Do you think that was good for me? Actually, I was happy. It's sort of embarrassing because I've told people, y'all need to come to church. Give your soul to Jesus. Then I turn around and tell you, you need to come to the temple and listen to the life-giving teachings of Elijah Muhammad. So a lot, some people might have joined the nation of Islam because of me. They might have joined the church because of me. But now here I am. I find out I'm wrong on both accounts. That's not my fault. I didn't know. I acted upon what I knew. I didn't know any better. 
There are people who will refuse to buy an electric car. I ain't buying no electric car. Yeah, I didn't. Even though we know that the electric car is more beneficial, they're not going to let go. They're going to hold on to gas-powered cars as long as possible because they don't want to make that change. What's wrong with it? We've been doing that for a for hundred years. We've been driving gas. Now all of a sudden you want to go electric. Electric car. I don't want to care about no electric car. That's, that's how y'all act. You don't like change. Has nothing to do with right or wrong. We just found a better way. Solar power, electric power, these are the ways of the, of the future. No, oh, I don't care about no uh, uh, gas. Burn some coal, burn some wood or whatever. There are those who refused to get into a car. They did not want to give up the horse. Environmentally, of course, as you know, the horse is a better choice. This modern day society that we live in is powered by fossil fuel, cars, trucks, and airplanes. The reason why you can be a vegan, the reason why you enjoy the way you live right now is because of fossil fuel. Because cars, trucks, airplanes bring stuff from all over the world for your comfortable, happy ass to use. Prior to that, your choices was limited. And then of course, the trains, let's not forget trains. Trains was able to bring certain products and, and goods that people uh, normally wouldn't have an opportunity to have because of trains. So our lives, this modern life that we have is not because of a horse or a mule. It's because of gas-powered Planes, trains, automobiles, and whatever. And you enjoy that. I very much doubt any of you want to go back to riding a horse. You'll do it for fun, but you wouldn't want to actually go back to riding horses. Which one day we might have to do that. Who knows in the future. But right now... Your lifestyle is based upon you got electricity in your house. That's unnatural. That's against, I'm pretty sure some people, that's against God. God made the sun. That's the, that's the only light we need. And of course, there are older people right now that hate computers. They hate the internet. When the sky opened up to me, it's embarrassing. But I, I didn't know. I didn't know these things. But now I know. I'll tell you this. It's like I'm on the job and you're working something. You're doing something, you work. Don't you get happy when you find a better way to get the job done? It don't take so long as less effort. Don't you get happy? Wow, I'm going to stop doing that. I found a, a better way to get this job done. And you get happy. And you pass it down to the other person. Hey, bro, I found a different way to do things. Do it this way. Oh man, I don't... No, go ahead, try it, bro. Alright, you say so. Da, da. Hey, this is better. <laughs> this is better. Operation Exodus Mississippi campaign. 
Try it, bro. It's better. It'll get the job done. It's still a car. It's still a computer. It's still the struggle. It's just a different way to get the job done. We've tried these other ways. Let's get the job done. So when my eyes began to open, I was happy, embarrassed, but I got happy. Because now I know I don't have to believe anymore. The word belief, I don't even have to use anymore. Having faith, and hope, I don't have to do that no more. Because now, I know. And so, I must speak reality. Regardless of the consequence, no matter how much you hate what I have to say, you dislike. I don't care. Because this is the information. This is the teaching, if that's what you want to call it. This is what you need to solve your problem once and for all. And if people can die for the Bible, if people can suffer for the Quran, if people can do those things, sacrifice, why can't I suffer? Why can't I sacrifice? Why can't I die for the reality, for the truth? When I know, not believe, when I know it will solve our problem once and for all. And take us to the heaven that you talk about in your Bible. Isn't it worth sacrificing my life for? Apparently, somebody, of course, you know, they did not, would not like that Pastor Hagen is telling people that Jesus did not exist. So he's catching hell from a lot of folks simply because he said that. But then I take it to the ultimate position. All of it is garbage. All of it is fairy tale. Because his African village is nothing but Christianity that he wrapped Egyptology around it. Because you, Pastor Hagen, did not live in Kemet. So you don't know how those people practice. You didn't live in Kemet. All these folks, you never met a real Moor. You never met a real Hebrew Israelite. I heard that there are Ethiopian Jews and hell, they are alive. You don't even meet them. You're just talking. You never met these people. It's real. I don't have nothing to say about it. It's not real. And if it's real, bring your happy ass. You can come here or I will come to your live stream so you can show us in real time how it's real. It's a belief. There's nothing against the law against believing in lies. There's nothing against the law that you can believe in your fairy tales or whatever. Matter of fact, the government Happy that you do it that way because that kind of stuff keeps you docile. That's why you will not, that's why the black black American in this country as a whole will never rise up like Hamas or those people in Afghanistan. You're, you're not a fighter. You're a lover. <laughs> You, you love everybody. Even these blackly black folks, they love everybody too. I love everybody. 
Well, they don't love everybody, but they love... I love all the Africans. I love everybody from Jamaica. I love everybody from Barbados. I love everybody from New Guinea and Papua. I love, I love everybody. I love everybody. Only from only the melanated ones, though. But you, but 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 you love. You you're a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> See, they don't like me because. They know I know that they full of bull doo doo. I've been real like this all my life. When you was playing with dolls, I was protesting against Jim Crow. When you were sucking on Similac, I was in the streets trying to teach, fighting for justice for our people. And some of you was wearing diapers. Wasn't even born yet. And then you have the nerve to try to come at me. I bring my life experience to you. And incarceration actually did help me. Because it put me in a position to test Jesus. It put me in a position to test Muhammad. Because I, Jesus didn't do nothing. The devil didn't do nothing. And I'm like, and you know, so I'm telling you, I, now when, when it got to the devil, I was sort of scared because I was spooky. I, I was real spooky. Because I didn't know what to expect. When I asked, I asked the devil for help. Uh, Mr. Satan, uh, Mr. Devil, sir, if you can get me out of this, I will be the best devil worshiper, Satan worshiper you ever had. I didn't know. I thought, I'm spooky. I thought maybe smoke would come in my room and fire come up. <laughs> Even though I was taught the white man is the devil, I still, that spooky image of the devil was still in my mind. I'm like, okay, here we go. Because I'm desperate. Can you, a devil, can you help me out of this situation? And he didn't do nothing either. It's all lies. Mythology. Fairy tales. It's not real. So, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I don't know, I don't know really what to, what to do with this. I know better now, but what can I do? So by 2007, I was first introduced to YouTube, 2007, and I joined YouTube just to listen to Minister Farrakhan and some of the other teachers, John Henry Clark. I didn't know who John Henry Clark was. I learned about John Henry Clark and Dr. Ben and Francis Cress Welsing and a whole lot of other brothers and sisters. I began to listen to those videos. I did not have any intent to start making videos at all. And the reason why I wasn't going to make any videos because I did not have I didn't have nothing to say. I didn't have nothing to bring. But then I thought about it. I said, well, I'm different now. I see the reality of things now. And I just was wondering, are there other people like myself? I was just curious. Are there other people that have discovered this like I have? I'm just curious. So, so it was around um, November, December, something like that. I made my first video. And the first video, I think, 
It was talking about Malcolm X. Is he a hypocrite or whatever? But I just wanted to put videos out in the world. I just, I just wanted to see were there people like myself. And I began to see that there are. So I'm not the only one. But they're like me. They know better. But unlike me, I'm fired up. I want to tell everybody this is the way to go. They know, but don't do nothing with their knowledge. They don't hold themselves responsible. And instead of bringing solutions to solve the problem, they continue to be part of the problem. Comfortable on the slave plantation. But see, for me, this is easy because I've been doing this all my life. Fighting the bully. I've been doing it all my life. No big deal. So you don't hurt me coming at me. Because I've been doing it all my life. But now I got this truth. Bow down. That's the only thing you can do is bow down. Either you leave me alone or you need to stay the hell away from me or you need to come here and work with reality. And you're going to respect the house of reality. You can't do nothing with me because this is reality. The real truth. What is, what is the real truth? Look it up. I don't even have to make up a, a definition. Go to the Webster's Dictionary. Your happy ass speak English. Look it up. It's right there. Because I looked it up. I'm not going to tell your ass. Go to the dictionary. And find out what the real truth is. I don't even have to make up nothing. You speak English, look it up. Death threats, I, I had to deal with death threats over the years. People want to assault me because of this word. Did I stop talking? No. Do we, like the brother Dick and brother say, the soul train keeps rolling. I keep rolling. I'm going to roll whether a hundred thousand listen to me, I'm going to roll if zero. I've come on the platform zero listening and I could talk the same way I'm talking now, the same way I would if it says zero. That's my self-appointed responsibility. But it makes no difference. I only have 10 subscribers. I only get 10 views. But still, I'm worthy of death threats. I'm worthy of threats about being assaulted. I'm, I'm worthy of slander and gossip. I'm still worthy of my channels getting taken down. Why? Because of the paranoia of a black messiah. Not only from white folks, but the black folks too. Because the black messiah, they wanted to come from those who believe in Marcus Garvey, those who believe in Malcolm, those who believe in the honorable Mr. Farrakhan, those who believe in Israelite stuff. Look at your black messiah. And when you're looking at your black messiah, it ain't Angel Snuffin' Up 7. Your black messiah is you. Because you never hear me say, I can do this. I 
can do that. I always tell you it's about us. And if your happy ass want to be a comfortable slave, so be it. No skin of my knuckles. I don't care. But don't get angry because I'm, I'm telling you about what you are. You should be happy. You're angry because I'm the man in the mirror. I'm showing you exactly who and what you are. That's what you're angry about. Because you want to see yourself as this freedom fighter. You want to see yourself as this revolutionary. And you want to see yourself as this highly intelligent supreme wisdom. Whatever. Eh, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing but a, a feral slave. Running around America. Trying to find a place to do something. The black man and woman in America. Is no different. Than a feral pig, a feral cat, a feral dog. If you on a farm and the farm go bankrupt and the farmer and his wife, children, yeah, they just leave. Open up the gates. And that's what they that's what they done to us, our ancestors. They they just open up the gates, y'all, y'all free. Our people was like. What? Say what? Y'all free. Free to do what? You you you, you free to, to, to go live on live on my own? How's I supposed to do it? That's what they done to our ancestors. They didn't have no idea. They don't know what freedom is. And the only freedom that they know is trying to be like the slave master. So when you see Jay-Z and Beyonce, shout out to Jay-Z and Beyonce. I'm not, I'm not directing nothing towards them. It's, it's us. Or Oprah Winfrey, or Gail King, or Will Smith and Jada, or our 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 millionaires and billionaires, our people, our middle class, even you. You living like them. That's the only freedom that you know. You ain't trying to live like they do in China. You're not trying to live like the Twa people. That's freedom. You don't want to live like the Twa people in Africa. You want to live like Europeans because that's all you know. That's all you know is living like Europeans. So you run around here. And I'm a Pan-African and, and I'm an African-African. You are, you are a Negro pen. Like the way you try to make mockery of others. That's all you know. He keep his happy ass in America because that's all you know. Some of you eat soul food. You probably don't eat it the way you used to. But y'all y'all like macaroni and cheese. You, you like collard greens and, uh, and, and soul food. Cornbread. You still like, you like that stuff. Because this is you. That's all we know for hundreds of years. That's how we live. All this other stuff is foreign. And you put on your costumes. Trying to dress up like some ancient Israelites. And you put on your costume. Trying to dress up like some Arab. That's not you. And the people. Our people who just being. Who are just being themselves. Watch you go up and down the street in your costume. Look at them Hebrew Israelites. Look at them Yahweh being Yahweh folks. Look at look look at them nation of Islam with them bow ties like that in in your costume. That represent what? Something you don't have nothing to do with. Cause you never live in the Middle East. You never lived in Africa. You never lived in foreign land. So the black man and woman in America, soul brothers and sisters in this country, the only thing you know is America. The only way you can be an African, and you will never be, but your children can, you have to take your children to Africa 
and let them live with an African tribe of your choice. And the generations that come after, they will be African. That's the only way they can be African. You, my friend, will never be. Unless, unless you're like the Bible say. Unless you're born again. And you can't physically, that's not going to happen. The only way you can be born again, your children got to go to Africa, be adopted by a tribe, and then their children and the generations after, yes, they will become African. You are Negro pen. So you can say black first. You can say black to the, to the fourth power. You can say Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism unapologetically. Pan-African, black, whatever. You can do all that. When you finish foaming at the mouth, it's easily proven you are an American Negro. And I just accept that fact. I also accept I don't want to be those things. What's so special about being some African? What's, what's the benefit? Because as you know, Caucasian people didn't like Native American folks. But then when this country start giving out that land, American. I'm a Native American. I got Native American blood in me. Because there's a benefit. There's no benefit. A lot of us, we would be happy to be Africans if there was some kind of benefit. You don't even get a benefit. They begging us. They, they have land. They have resources. And they begging us for money. They begging to get what little we got. What well, That don't even make any sense. And I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you, if this nation decided to begin to give land or reparations to the black American soul brothers and sisters, foundational black Americans, freedmen, descendants of freedmen in this country, if this country ever begin to do that, there's a lot of pure white people. Oh, I got black people in my family. And they'll, they'll try to prove that they, they are descendants of slaves born in America. Because there's a benefit. And the Africans, uh, I, I'm related to them. I'm related to those African Americans. But ain't nobody doing it because there's no benefit. So why should I be happy? Why should we go all crazy about being related to some Africans? There's no benefit. And we're not even specific about it. What Africans we supposed to be? I'm a little bit of this and a, I'm a little bit of that. When these Europeans, when these Chinese, when all these people talk about, they can tell you exactly what part of China they come from, what part of Europe they come from. But with us, we're nothing but a whole continent. Even though the history says we're supposed to be from West Africa. So who are we supposed to be? So I say, forget all that. Just accept who you are. And believe me, when you become brothers and sisters, when we become who we are, they'll want to become you. You don't have to worry about trying to be them. They'll be happy. I want to be that. Like in the 70s. You don't know nothing about this. But those who grew up in the 70s, when soul power, when soul was, we was at our height. When you went to the record store, it was about soul music, not R&B. It was about soul music. And soul people, we was putting out the hits. Folks around the world, they wanted to be a soul brother and sister. They want to be part of that. This group called Hall and Oath. Blue Eyed Soul Brothers. What they made that movie with Dan Aykroyd and, and what's his name? 
the Blues Brothers or whatever it was, had Aretha Franklin in the movie. Folks trying to be us. We sitting around here trying to be them. Be them for what? All over the earth they was trying to be like us. We make America. We make people want to be American in this country. We are the culture of America. We're much more than entertainment, but we are the entertainment in this country. We are the music. We are the sports. Take us out of the equation. America ain't nothing. We are track and field. We are basketball. And we are the best preachers. We are the best teachers. We are the best orators. It's a lot ab about you. And you want to give what you got to somebody else. And giving them nothing. What's wrong with you? It's mine. I'm selfish. I want her. I want her. I'm selfish. I want her. My, this is mine. I want her to be mine. I don't want to share her with nobody else. I want to protect her. I want to cherish her. I want to provide for her. I want to die for her. I don't want to share. Anybody can come in our neighborhood and get with her. What kind of men are you? You don't protect, you don't provide, you're just a ding a -ling. You're just somebody. I sure got, I sure got, I got the big one. I got the big one. Everything about you is big. You're a big ass fool too. You big silly, you're a big clown. Don't forget, don't don't forget, brother. Though <laughs> this this is real important. <laughs> Still acting like a mandingo. Nobody takes you seriously, as seriously as men in civilization. Our children should not be in foster care. Our children should not be in orphanages. Our women should not be in strip clubs swinging down a pole. Our women should not be in pornography. This shows you the failure of us as men. Our people should not be homeless on the street. That shows you that the men in the group have failed. Because we have enough resources. What do our people do when they get out of jail and prison? We always talk about uh, the, the, the prison, the pipeline, school to prison, the pipeline. That We love to say that. What do we do for our people who've been locked up for years and years and years and they don't have nothing coming out of prison? You have, we have nothing for them. And then when they reoffend, that's a damn shame. That's a damn shame what happened to Tommy. He couldn't find no job because he's an ex-convict and he messed around, went back to the drug game. He back in prison for life now. That's a damn shame. Yes, it is a damn shame. You don't hear the Hebrew Israelites. You don't hear the Moorish Science Temple. You don't hear the Nation of Islam. You don't hear all these pan Africans. You don't, you don't hear them talking like this because Talking like this means it's going to take money out of the leadership pocket because they don't give a damn about us. The money that many of your so-called leaders is using to live high on the hog, you can open up foster care. You can open up uh, affordable housing and uh, these, these uh, halfway houses for our people coming out. And different things to help our people get on their feet. Programs so to try to avert them going to prison and jail to begin with. We don't offer legal services to our people. 
whether it's criminal or civil. And you run around like they doing. You ain't doing a damn thing. Taking the money and squandering. That's why they don't like Angel Snup Nup 7. Because I'm the man in the mirror. I'm not going to let you paint yourself as something that you're not. I'm not going to let you get credit that you did not earn. I'm not going to let... I'm not going to give myself, nor do I want credit that I do not earn. If I tell you something that I've done, it's because I earned it and I can prove it. I don't have to try to paint it a certain way and try to make it, make something that's not into, no, it's quite obvious that's what it is. I don't want unearned credit. I don't want to, I don't want credit. I got to try to prove something. No, it's quite obvious. There's nothing to debate. There's nothing to argue about. I will show you. If I can do 20 push-ups, 30 push-ups, I will show you. There was a fat lady. I'm going to say this. We're going to get out of here. <laughs> there was a fat lady. I said that she weighed 300 or close to 300 or over 300 pounds. There's no need for debate. There's no need to argue. Pull out the scale. Get on the scale. Let's see. They never got on the scale. Because they know they weigh close to 300, 300 or over 300. That's why they wouldn't show and prove. They want you to guess. They want you to do. Do I look like? Do I look like I weigh? Yes, you do look like you weigh three hundred pounds. If uh, get on the scale. Yes, you do. Yes, you do look like you. You weigh three hundred pounds. I would say that you weigh four hundred. I'm giving you the benefit of a doubt. With three hundred, they never got on the scale. Easy to prove. If God exists, if Jesus exists, whatever we believe, if it's real, it should be easy, easy to prove. But it's not. That's why it's called belief. If we know, there's no need to believe. Is actual facts. Just like in the teachings of, of Elijah Muhammad, the nation of Islam. They believe that God came in the person of Master Farah Muhammad, July 4th, 1930. They believe. But then they have the actual facts. This is what we know. And science backs them up. This is what we know. But science don't back up a belief that God came to us in the person of Master Farah Muhammad. Science don't support that. And Elijah don't even teach that. Elijah Muhammad said, this is what we believe. And you can take it or let it alone. I say that we need to gravitate and you can believe oh you know you can believe these things some of us we need that some of us it's all right but your belief should not keep you from doing the right thing so that us as a people we can move forward and solve this problem once and for all and we say here on this platform that this vision that we call Operation Exodus Mississippi Campaign and many of these folks, they trip off the name because they just want to trip off something. They don't know what it's about. I, I, uh, I ain't going to Mississippi. Nobody said nothing about going to Mississippi. I've never said that. That's a distraction tactic. 
an intelligent person, well, and somebody did try. They did a lousy job. Somebody did try. <laughs> they did try. They did a lousy job. Because you will always do a lousy job. There's nothing wrong with the foundation of the Mississippi campaign. And if you wasn't so jealous and envious and jealous, you can only make the foundation stronger. Because in sincerity, you can say, you can pull out what won't work. So as we build, it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. But you're so jealous and envious and you're narcissist and grandiose. Because you want to give it, give all the credit to any success to your God. You can do that. I don't care. As long as the job get done. You can do it and don't even have to mention my name at all. Those who know, know. They got that from snuff nut. But those who don't know, and you might as well tell them basically where you got it from because eventually somebody's going to, they're going to learn well, it was this guy. He was crazy and everything, but they they got that from Snutner. I thought y'all, I thought Allah got, gave that to y'all. I thought Jesus gave, gave that to y'all. Y'all got that from some crazy guy, Snutner? That's the problem. You don't want to give Angel, you don't want to give Angel no credit. You don't want to give yourself credit, because that's who I give the credit to. Because Mississippi campaign is nothing but a modern day version of the behaviors and the actions of our ancestors after the Civil War. I just brought it to modern times and put and made a plan out of it. It's us. So you want to make mockery, you're making mockery of your ancestors that you claim you love. Oh no, you don't love black American ancestors. You don't love your, your soul brothers and sisters ancestors, freedmen, foundational black American ancestors. You don't like them anyway. You in love with African. What have they done for you lately? Put in the chat room. What have the Africans done for you lately? Two billion dollars in Ghana. What was that? Night, two thousand nineteen, right before the COVID thing happened. Uh, let's go to Ghana. Return to the motherland. Ghana made two billion dollars off Black American. Maybe some, a little, a, a little. Uh, they said off of just off Black American. Cause I know, I know people like I'm saying it again. Beyonce, Beyonce and Jay Z, they went. And I think Michelle Obama, they went, and, and some other black people, they went to Ghana. How much of that $2 billion did black America get back from Ghana? What did, black, what did Ghana do for black people except give you a tour of some, of some of, it's, it's probably real, don't have nothing to do with you. Some slave dungeons and some other broken down buildings or whatever. I feel, I feel as though I with my ancestors. How do you feel? Now I know where my grandfather and grandmother live, and I can go there, and I know they live there. I'm not my ancestors. I'm not going to tell you no lie like that. My grandfather and grandmother not even buried there. So how the hell can I feel them? They ain't lived there, they ain't lived there in a, oh, probably a hundred years. You know, and I know my grandparents. How the hell you going to go to a foreign country and get on some land and look at a slave bunker cabin or whatever and talk about, I feel my, you didn't know they probably built that yesterday. You don't even know if that's real. And you, you feel it. Somebody said, what was his name? That brother Chief X. 
He said he went to Africa. He could feel his ancestors. No, you felt the heat and the humidity. That's what you felt, sir. We ain't felt no ancestors. We lied to ourselves. I was talking about this not too long ago about my mother. And I told this lie, but the lie made her happy. And she never let it go. Because that lie, that fabrication, it made, it made her happy. And that's what these African DNA tests, quackery, going to Africa, this just makes you happy, brings you comfort. It's lies. It's not real. When was the last time you went to your grandmama grave? Some of the grave sites, I'm going to say this, I need to get out of here. Some of the grave sites where black people are buried is in horrible condition. You can go to Africa talking about, I can feel my ancestor. You ain't even going to your own grave sites. Weeds everywhere. Tombstone rotten. White people come to clean your graveyard up. I seen on TV. I see white people bringing in equipment, picking up the trash, tearing up the weeds, trying to clean up the headstone. Where your happy ass at? Tell about your ancestors in Africa. I can feel them, and you don't even feel your own people. In the graveyard where you know they buried. We so fake. Hate fake folks. Y'all fake. So this is why they don't like Angel Snapping Up Seven. And I'm gonna speak real truth. I'm gonna speak the reality of things. Whether you like it or not, I could care less. And I don't care about death. Before or after the cancer. I don't care. So what? I would rather go to my grave speaking this. At least I can I can say I tried to help them. They wouldn't listen. But they can't say I did not try to tell them. The people actually are ready. The leadership is not ready. And the leadership is the black conscious community. The leadership are those who are leading the charge. You're the leaders. But you're incompetent you don't know what to do. And you're scattered. And you can't unify with other people. So why should they follow you? You're not an example of black love. You're not an example of black unity. You're not an example of competence. Why should they follow you? Louis Farrakhan been talking all that black unity uh, unity is as powerful as an atomic bomb way back in 1985. Who has he unified with? He's not unified with nobody. Unless you are following behind him, he's not interested. He's not interested. He's not unified with nobody. All these suckers ain't unified with nobody. Because if it's not about them, they're not interested. They, wanna, they want you to follow them. And where are we going to follow you to, sir? Where are we going to follow you, ma'am? To Arabia. To the grave site of a dead prophet. Walk around the Kaaba. We're going to kiss a black rock. You hate people, but you don't kiss a rock. <laughs> <laughs> you
You hate people, but you kiss a rock. You love a book from a foreigner. As a Muslim, you put on high regard. But you hate the human being that the book was supposed to be revealed to save. <laughs> Woo! Folks are so fake. Uh, folks are so fake. Exactly. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I appreciate it. It's always an honor that you would give us a, a moment of your time <clears throat> because you could be doing something else. Thank you so much. Shout out again to uh, Dickens of Reality, Mellow Cap, Almond Delight. Let me get my people. Let me see if I can get everybody. Because there's only a few of us that's really down. Shout out to Brother Talil. He was just on the program yesterday. We thank Brother Talil for his message. <clears throat> Shout out to MD20. I saw him in the uh, chat room on our sister station, Angel Snub Number 7. Uh, sister Ann. Tafari Smith, Angela Hines. Razzy Fry. Um... Brother Denzel, Sister Tangie and her family out there in California. Um, Phil Fox. Phil Fox. Who else is out there? Phil Fox. Sean Davis and Christopher Steffens, our people in London. Uh, just acting and the resident out there in London, England. I think that's it. That's the main, main ten. We only have ten people. Also, um, Z-Mad. Z-Mad is still out there too. So we want to send a shout out to, to Z-Mad. And of course, <clears throat> we want to invite you to participate and support our main video live stream of the year. We call it Soul Liberation Day 2024. Our theme is Free Your Mind. These ladies have a song, Free Your Mind. And the rest will follow December the 7th, 2023, 2.30 p.m. Central Time. And we do um, expect, and on the schedule, we, we would like, we want to uh, send a shout out to, to the MD20, a guest speaker for that day. Also, um, Black Sun Blue. And our brother Talib. We hope that we can come together and have a nice time. Soul Liberation Day 2024. Free your mind and the rest will follow. On that note, y'all, out there in YouTube land, as Don Cornelius would say as in parting, I wish us love. Peace and so we are Audi 5000, I think.